Okay, hello and welcome to another episode of Hiring and Inspiring. Today's guest is Jason Loft. Jason is a well sales professional, a legal professional as well, uh, and also uh, a podcaster uh, in, in a recent um, development of his and his, his career. So we connected a short while back. Um, I know he's been doing some really interesting stuff recently. He's made a big sort of career transition, so to speak. So looking forward to catching up with him finding out how um, this transition he, he he's made most recently and also catching up uh, and a little bit learning about his journey and reflecting on uh, his prior uh, work experience and how it's all led him to where he is today. So Lofty, with that introduction, mate, welcome to the show. How are you getting on? Thank you. Yeah, very good. Very good. Like I said, a bit of a change and it's nice. It feels like my actual office isn't as nice as the backdrop here, but it looks like I've got a nice corner office. <laughs> But I'm working. That'll be the goal: <laughs> is work toward that corner office. Yeah. <laughs> we could talk about some of those goals in, in a bit, <laughs> mate. Um, the the big news, as I said, is you know you switched up your career earlier this year. Um, you know, a good few months back back now, transitioning from you know working in the, the sales uh, industry, you know, in the electrical industry, um, to now working you know sales capacity for uh, a legal firm, which is you know uh, two very different industries. Let, let's 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 be honest. How, how have you found that that transition so far? Yeah, it was a big. Cause I sort of went. I guess I've been in sales in one way or another since I was eighteen or probably fifteen. And this one last six years was all about it was electrical wholesaling. So it was all it was still business to business dealing with tradies every day. Um, but you're selling products, and then. Yep. selling professional services uh it was a big it was a big transition more i was more nervous about it because i just had never done it i'd never got out there and sold like normally i've got something i can show people like there's something physical that we're okay yeah giving whereas this was all ethereal and it's all so the law in itself like what you're selling to me is certainty. Like people come to you generally where in corporate law, what I'm doing, people are coming to you when they're in a bit of a crisis. And so the actual sale um, is more just giving them certainty that, Hey, we're going to hold your hand through this and we're the right people to do that. Um, so I was, I was very nervous because I kind of, I guess I sold myself in the interview that no, 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 it's fine. I can do this transition. No worries. <laughs> Because it's all people. Um, first few weeks, big learning curve. Because I, I obviously had to understand there's a lot more restrictions in. You can't. Uh, it's not necessarily overpromise or anything, but you got to be careful in setting people's expectations to say, "Hey, you are in a bit of legal strife here, and it's not exactly like I can tell you we'll sort it out." But there's no guarantees that'll happen because um, you're dealing with disputes yeah. between humans. But now that I've been doing it sort of a few months, I've realized, which is nice, people like sales is just all about building a relationship and understanding people and hopefully adding value to people and finding out what's their actual like pain points and how can you help them solve that. Um, and in the law, I mean, that's even then it can be ambiguous. Like a dispute might be over the builder hasn't paid on time or whatever it might be. The extension keeps getting delayed, things like that. Um, there's always people underlying it. And I find it's just about giving people a chance to vent, get their, um, get their story out. And then I can go, okay, now take a deep breath. Here's your rights and your obligations. And here's essentially what we can sell you, which is either we'll take you, help you go to court or let's get this person to the negotiation table. Um, for me, mm. it's all like my brain just works at looking at what's the next product that's going to help them solve their issue. Um, and even in the law, it's yeah. still that way. Um, but yeah, they're both they're both just people, and that's what gave me a lot of confidence because I realised okay, people, yeah, whilst okay. it's a professional service and everything, it's still going to be the same people, and they've got the same needs, wants, desires. Um, and as long as you can tap into yeah. that, you can do well. Interesting, mate. So, talk to me a little bit more about the actual the, the day to day of the the new role. Then, so what 
you've touched on a few things there about you know you're, you're you're still helping people you're still you're selling more of a service but how does it work are you you know proactively looking to find clients and and, and sell your firm's you know professional service and, and and then guiding them through the process how, how does it all work if there was like a i don't know a typical day what does it look like um yeah i initially for me because i'm sort of in a unique position i'm i'll be admitted as a solicitor hopefully in about a month's time actually um so i'm I yep. guess learning the law of how to deliver the service at the same time. Mm. So for me, the gotcha, first one, yeah. I just said to them, let's pick one area, which was debt recovery. Um, two days a week, I was just head down, bum up, like filing claims, learning how to write claims, doing letters, actually learning the brunt of it. So then the other three days, I could confidently go out and talk to businesses. And it was, for me, a bit of cold calling. Um, yeah. It's sort of I, the way I do it. I like to start with a cold email. Um, I actually like to research people beforehand to go, do they fit like my ideal client um, base? For us, we do a lot of high volume, um, well, big corporations or even government departments who need a fair bit of debt recovery. So it was doing the pre-qualifying. And then it's about, um, I looked at what's a, what's a problem most of these people would face um, fortunately, when you're looking at government departments, you can actually do the research and find out they've got annual reports. So you can literally look yeah. at, oh, how much bad debts did they have last year? Um, so that's actually was my process was I like to just research people in depth. And then if they fit my ideal client profile, um, then I find out, okay, what, what are the problems that I can see? What are problems I know similar clients have faced? And then what solutions can I offer? Um, because before, yeah. for me, before going for the ask of, hey, can we do your debt recovery or can we have business from you? I like sort of, I look at it as having um, solutions in the bank. Like I've helped them solve maybe two or three problems of added value, mm -hmm. added value, added value. Um, and then it's sort of, hey, by the way, we have this service that you guys might be able to enjoy. And I find, yeah. It takes, it's probably a six week process to go from start to finish. But generally, if we, if I've narrowed in on a client that, hey, I really want to get their business, um, yeah, it's usually pretty, nothing's a certainty. But yeah, yeah, if you actually care about getting their business and the reason you care about getting their business is to help them, um, I think they pick up on mm. that because it's not just, hey, I'm nagging you, hey, can I have the business? Can I do some debt recovery for you? It's, Hey, did you know we have a process that we can do? Did you know we've got lawyers who have done this for 20 years and they can come train your staff on improving yeah. the recovery like the processes you do? Um, yeah, it's never never asking until it's at the point. They usually just offer it. Yeah, that's brilliant. I really like that, how you're not just sort of calling up and then you know asking what their problems are or asking you know, for the business. You're calling them up already knowing what the problem that the problems they have mm. and then you're also calling them up with the solution already <laughs> well that's and, yeah um, and when, yeah. even if it doesn't happen in that conversation i think i think that's for me what sales has always been it's being over prepared and showing your clients that you care enough um yeah my missus gives me stick sometimes because i do do a lot of research before i get yeah. into a business but as far as I'm concerned, like if I want them to genuinely know I care, I, I would research them, find out their backstory. Why'd they go into business? Why'd they start this? What's the industry issues they might have? Um, yeah, we discussed it when you were talking about recruiting. It's it's showing them that you care enough to do all that research up front. It, it's, it's very much not a sort of spray and pray approach then. You're not just calling up anyone and everyone and nah. hoping something sticks you're, you're really getting strategic in this role like find the ideal customers learn, get under their skin learn the business and then offer the, the solution yeah and then now it's been probably four or five months now i've sort of got systems in place i guess to do that which and that's why i like a lot of your content it's sort of mm. mondays okay you need to be doing the cold email but it is a pre-researched email but it's 10 of them to reach out to 10 potentials and then put that in a sequence. So next week, yeah. if they haven't responded, hey, quick follow-up. Then if they haven't, hey, give them a call. 
and it's sort of now it's in a sequence. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can't stand the um, call it the shotgun approach, which is just play a numbers game, which I have. Look, people have told me I just yeah. play the numbers game, just keep calling. I'm like I, I'm terrified. Like for someone who's been in sales my whole life, I hate rejection. I hate dealing with the <laughs> the nose okay. and stuff. I'm used to it, but I still hate it. So I go out of my way to avoid that by narrowing down on who's the ideal client and let's show them why we're the ideal solution. Hmm. I like what you said about the process as well, by the way, like so much of so much of sales is is having the right processes and habits and systems in place hmm. because it's what we do, you know, you don't necessarily maybe a bit different in your profession, but like so much of it is, you know, we're not you know not always the sort of smartest person people about you're not always the, you know, you, you don't you don't always have to have be the best talker. If you if you just have the right systems and processes in place where you can just consistently get whatever it is that those emails out, the calls out, whatever the, the the content out, and you can back that up consistently. That's that's how. And it sounds like you're you know you're implementing those systems and, and already seeing results, which is yeah, mate, it's great to um, great to hear. Mm. I um I, I wanted to, want to touch up on the the change itself you know earlier this year we spoke about how your background before this role in, in, you know, in the legal industry was working for you know in the electrical wholesale the electrical industry what what brought about this change what what, what made you sort of switch up um you know careers at this at this point in your life um the the career change was always going to be planned i so i've had businesses since i was 18. um me and my wife had several businesses through our twenties, and then we had one of the businesses. Um, I think we ended up with seven franchises at the time, and one of those franchisees um, tried to sue us, and it ended up we we won it and everything, but it was quite a legal minefield, and that's when I, yeah. um, at the time, was going through. My father was blowing the whistle. Um, he was in politics. And he was going through some legal issues for that. And so I decided I'm going to study law because um, I can just see the benefit. One, for business owners, how difficult it's becoming to navigate. There's so much legislation they, they have to be around, particularly in the construction industry. Um, and two, just because of the personal impact um, of what happened to my father. So yeah. I actually took a job in the electrical wholesaling as a business development purely because I just wanted a nine to five job while I studied law. Yeah. And then I had a five year yeah, plan. Okay. okay. Once that's done, I'm going to go be a lawyer. Um, that had been put on the whole, but my son's uh, nonverbal autism and we were living in a regional town at the time, um, not a lot of resources and support for it. So earlier this year, um, the opportunity sort of came and we made the decision, okay, we're going to try and get him into a good school down in Brisbane. And that happened to coincide with me finishing my degree. So it was sort of, yeah, let's take the leap, move to the big city and um, I'll test yeah. my skills out, one, as a, as a lawyer, but two, uh, yeah, combining those skills to, I didn't just want to be a lawyer because it, for me, it was a waste of sort of 15 years sales experience. Um, so I yeah. Yeah, presented yeah, myself yeah. as what if I can do a bit of both? What if, yes, I want to learn the law, but also what if I can bring clients, which obviously every law firm's keen <laughs> on someone who can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, mate. Um, so it sounds like it's been in the works for a, lo for a long time. You've been planning yeah. it and now it's happening. Now, now, now you're doing it. What are some of the ambitions where do you want to take it what are you what are some of the goals um, um what do you hope to I, achieve i guess in the next i realized years? i kind of i guess fell in love with not just the electrical industry but the construction industry as a whole it underpins yeah. so much of the economy like and i don't think people realize yeah. how important it is that thriving construction industry um yeah it means so many things uh, are sort of taken care of in the economy um, we look at housing and everything at the moment, the shortages. Um, so I've quickly realised now that I've been learning the law that I'm going to get, I guess my specialty is going to be in the construction industry focus, um, just helping business owners. 
for Navigate, I did a um, presentation the other day. I don't have them here, but it was sort of a table and we lined up all the legislation that even doesn't matter if you're a sparky or a plumber or a builder who's just going to go out on his own. It was like a boardroom table size and about sort of two foot high of printed legislation that, by the way, you should know it. You should know all this because if you trip up, ATO, ASIC, or someone's going to get you for it. And I was like, that's right. when I realised, okay, now I'm, I know I'm in the right thing because my job as a construction lawyer, um, once admitted, is going to be just helping these guys get through all that, navigate it, understand it. Yeah. And if they do get in trouble, protect them from, um, mm. yeah, the, the difficulties of it. Because there's so much, it's such a struggle being in business for yourself and, it shouldn't be made more difficult, but unfortunately, just the yeah. way society's gone the last 20, 30 years, it's becoming more and more, um, it's just only the big guys can sort of survive because they have teams of lawyers on retainer. Yeah. Um, I thought if I can do my part, even if it's only, you know, you can help 20, 40 businesses at a time, at least you can do that. Um, and it's quite rewarding for me putting that um yeah, putting my background and I guess my mates, I've got two brothers who are chippies, brother-in-law who's a sparky, another brother-in-law who's chippy. Like everyone in my, around me is in a blue collar um, trade business. And so I'm, yeah, <laughs> in a different industry, but definitely have my roots firmly planted back in construction. And you've also run a couple of businesses, right, yourself. So that... Mm you can draw on that experience and you know the, the, like what you say the the legal um uh, battle you had back in the day it's now all coming together sort of thing you, mm. know, you can pull on that business that, that experience of running a business to know what your clients are going through say to really understand that you're pulling on the the sales experience that you've had and you're pulling the the legal degree and you put it together mate so it sounds like this is you know this is the <laughs> The plan yeah. has all come together. <laughs> These things will yeah, yeah, yeah. don't they? <laughs> yeah, and that's it's been pretty cool. Some by like obviously I didn't I studied the degree on purpose and a lot of the things were Yeah. Me making a plan, executing it, doing it. But then other things it's only in looking back and when you go for admission you have to make this disclosure document and say like, here's all the things that may adversely affect me. Um and obviously if there's court cases, things like that I've been through, I had to list them. And it's as I'm listing them, I'm going, oh, I was kind of, <laughs> you can see I was being prepared to um, take on a role like this. Because it's all those things, yeah, culminating into hopefully what's a unique um, <laughs> and good, yeah, litigator. All right. And, mate, earlier this year you uh, you launched your own podcast as well, Lofty Learns. Give it give it a little shout out. Mm -hmm. um, how, how's that all been uh, been going so far? Yeah, good. I um, It was, I guess, for a bit of fun, two things. I moved to a brand new city, so mm. having to build out a network. Um, and I remember yeah. hearing, I don't know if it was Gary V, Jordan Beeson, there was one of those guys, they said, might have even been Rogan, like, if you do a podcast, it's such a good excuse to meet people. One, give them a chance yeah. to shout out their business. Um and two, like I listen to them constantly, audio books or podcasts, and I thought, well, yeah, that's how I learned so many things. Um, why don't I just start doing it myself? Because um, I want to keep learning. And I find it's kind of cool doing it like so many people have a podcast these days, but it's just fun watching it slowly grow. And you see oh, every guest you get on, like, They've got sort of 10 or 20 people in their network that will definitely watch and definitely want to see it. Um, and you can see how if you keep doing this, and for me, it's not about money, it's not about anything. It's about I want to try and meet a new person every week, um, you know, learn whatever they're in. What is Generally, I'm doing a lot of business owners or people who are picking goals in their career. Um, yeah, just extract what are they doing well, what habits are they learning. Um, twofold selfishly so i can take some of those ideas um but also oh, just yeah. oh, to build yeah. out a network like and that's how yeah. we're doing this one to go like a, a rising tide will lift all boats so i know for a fact if anyone needs sales salesman i know i'm sending them to you to do the recruitment um 
<laughs> yeah, and I think appreciate it, mate. <laughs> well, those little things like you just build out this. You can build quite a cool network of podcasts. Well. Yeah, yeah. But you, you talk about you mentioned it a few times there. You know, you just love learning. You know, your podcast is called Lofty Learns. That mm. sort of thirst for for knowledge and learning uh, is clear. It's evident in in your own personality. Where where do you think that sort of comes from? It was I reckon I was twenty. It was when I got sued and realised. Um, yeah, I certainly didn't know it all. I didn't get enough lawyers involved at the time. I thought I'm a smart guy. I can outmaneuver this. Um, and I enough. listened. I think it was Tom Billu at the time. He's on Impact Theory, and he said he had a switch in his brain when he was about 23, 24, where he realised he doesn't need to be the smartest person in the room. In fact, he doesn't want to be anymore because he knows if he is, he's in the wrong room. And when you switch your yep. ego from, oh, I don't have all the answers but I'm the kind of guy who can soak up knowledge and get all the answers for you. It like, it just opens up your world dramatically. Um, and yeah, so I, I just had a switch and like even naming it, that is more, it's as a reminder to myself that yeah, I'm 32 now and I'll keep getting older. And as you learn more about the law, technically you get smarter and wiser and should have more answers for your client. But, I wanted something that no matter what, like my identity is almost tied to learning. Um, Cause I know as soon as you stop and I see it all the time, you see people who stop and they're suddenly on the smartest person in the room. You, you can see very quickly. <laughs> no, you're not. Cause you stopped reading, you stopped learning, you stopped taking in new information. Yeah. And if you're not doing that, you're, I mean, it's, it's scientific actually. You start dying. Um, so yeah, that first it was, it was making that cognitive switch um, from hearing that podcast. Going, oh, like imagine if that's your identity is actually. So when you're wrong about something, and when something doesn't go right, or you get the answer wrong, you actually get a boost, like in energy, in endorphins, in the hormones, because yeah. you're like, oh man, I learned something. Like it's such a, it's just a better <laughs> mindset to be honest. And I've found, yeah, the amount. It's only sometimes you realise, oh, I'm actually lo- I've learned a lot um, since I started that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting how often that that sort of mistake, or or just any, any sort of mistake, it, it starts with your own ego being the problem. Um, I always I always come can come back to that every time I sort of look, look back at my past and be like, right, I messed up there, or I didn't, I didn't, I could have done that better. It's always my own ego that was the problem like for instance like you said about um you know uh, you, when you took on that um you know legal situation you kind of like yeah i can deal with this no, no problem um I, i'm a smart guy uh, you know and i can I, and i can identify that in myself as well like i remember just on the topic of like learning i remember i finished up university and i was like yep i think that's me done with learning um <laughs> you know i'm never yeah I'm, I'm you know i'm finished and looking back you just you know how wrong was was that and and mm. I, 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 I cannot, like I said I can always go back to the main problem being your own ego and if you can drop that ego and realize that you know I'm far from finished there's always things I can be learning any sort of profession you're in you're never finished and I think as you say about if you can just adopt that mindset of just lifelong learning mm. um you know you're you're really you're really on to a, a, a winning a winning formula yeah mate um i, I wanted to you know you're saying about your you know you, you picked up on a, on a couple of things from from a podcast actually while we're talking about it what what um what have been some of maybe podcasts that have been you know sort of inspirational let's say in, in your journey where have you um where have you picked up a lot of knowledge because i'm always keen to know where um, um you know other, I, other people are gaining getting info from yeah, yeah, yeah. I started, I guess the ones that even to this day, I reckon it would have been 2015, 2016 when I started listening to them. Um, Rogan, I was listening to Joe Rogan back then. Purely, yeah. like, he can be a meathead and he's a comedian and stuff, but when he has guests 
he's just by sheer repetition doing three or four podcasts a week, he's become the best interviewer in the world because he just lets his guests speak. Um, so that was a huge one for me. Um, and then Impact Theory was another one. Tom Bilyeu, he built his own um, Quest Nutrition, billion-dollar company. And I sort of started okay, yeah. following him because I saw how well he'd done as a startup. And then he's gotten into more mindset, um, yeah, positive thinking, getting your mindset right. Tim Ferriss, um, the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, like all of them, I've sort of narrowed, I guess, a bit lately. And I try and do, I look at it like dieting almost. Um, yeah. Not dieting, but like, during the year, like if I need to knuckle down and when I was finishing all my degree and everything and I, I knew that complacency comes in, like, okay, I've been doing this four years. I don't need to study. I'm just thick and flick. I'll get through the final semester. And I could see, no, nah, that's not going to, like, you didn't get this far by doing that. So I, I sort of tune my Spotify playlist to go, I know who I need, which is Jocko Willink, David Goggins. People who are like, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, you yeah. think you're there, mate, get you, but get you fired up, get you fired yeah, up every day, get you fired up, and get you going. No matter how, yeah, how good you think you are, you you need to just keep reminding yourself there's someone out there working harder than you, someone trying to get there quicker, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, like, I keep a daily journal, I guess, for that exact purpose to know what am I facing in life, personally or in business. Okay. So what sort of content and that's the beauty now of having so much content out there um what's going to be the most beneficial for that situation because it's sort of like if you're going to go if you're going to go something you need short energy like you have a bit of sugar you have a bit of glucose you have a bit of energy drink um but it's certainly not something that you do if you're trying to have sustained long-term energy and i look at yeah the content i consume the same way to um like, what am I trying to solve? Usually it's what problems am, am I trying to solve? Yeah. And which people do I know have faced those problems before? <laughs> Chances are they've done a podcast on it now. Um, yeah. And then go find that that sort of tidbit, that snack, and yeah. eat it. And there's, yeah, I mean, there's so much time in the day that can be used for that. And that's what I learned when I was studying is, doing the dishes, doing all those chores that sometimes people think of as a chore. I relish now because I'm like, oh, sick. <laughs> like loading the dishwasher is 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. If I listen to a yeah. like podcast that's an hour long on one and a half speed, I can get through a whole podcast. Like mm -hmm. imagine how much learning I can do while I load the dishwasher. Yeah. 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 Nice. Good good little mindset switch that. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting, like just on, on, on podcasts, it's sort of, yeah, I think what the old thing used to be like you are you become the sort of sum of the the five you know friends that you spend most time with or something like that. I can't remember exactly yeah. how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you want you know you want to you want to be quite conscious about who you spend you know the five people you spend the most time with because you're most likely to you know get their you know similar opinions and 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 sort of be you know accustomed to to them quite a lot. That has probably changed a bit now. To it, you now become the sum of not for everyone, obviously, but the, probably the five podcasts you listen to most, yeah. um, because that you know, if, if you're surrounding yourself with a certain podcast that has a certain sort of view or a twist on things, it really can influence the way you go about your life. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think it should be should be uh, underestimated. No, I think it's um, mate, I, 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 dangerous. I wanna... Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, no, no. Well, I've... it is <laughs> like they're in. My wife jokes about it. She's like, "Are you talking to your buddy right now?" Because I've got. In Paris or someone in my ear, and I'm like, well, yeah, I yeah. kind of am. <laughs> yeah, but it is like you say, it's a it's a diet, like that content diet mm. um, is, is 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 almost reputable. You know what you what you're putting in your body in terms of food. Mm. One thing, just to pick up when you said just earlier about um, the the journaling, I hope you don't mind me asking this, and you don't mind sharing because it's something I'm always hearing that you know, the most sort of successful people and CEOs, the one thing they all have in common is they journal every day. Um, it, it's something, it's a habit I haven't necessarily personally been able to implement in my own life, but it's something, because I always hear about it, I think there must be something to it. What kind of benefits have you seen by, by doing that and, and what, kind of, what kind of things do you, do you journal, if you don't mind me asking, 
um, and any tips to even get that habit habit sort of get that habit moving? Yeah, I um, think it was a stoic. It was Marcus Aurelius, or there was it was Ryan Halliday books I was listening to, and that's where every single one of the Stoics kept a daily journal. And I think Marcus Aurelius himself, it was not meant for public consumption. He wrote a journal because he wanted his kids to have something. Um, so that for yeah. me uh, gave me the purpose because I was like, if I could leave something for my young fella, um, it would be a roadmap of how I managed to deal with the chaos that is just being a human being. Um, so I started literally just um, mine was just writing. So whatever was coming into my head, I was writing it out. And I was like, oh, you realise quickly some of this stuff is just stupid. But if you you only realise that when you physically put it pen to paper and you sort of go, why yeah. am I even thinking like that? Like, I know that's I know, not okay, the way yeah. to look at this problem. And then I, because I've done it for so long now, I refined it down to habit because I realised um, that atomics, Atomic Habits book, like if you don't do it on a daily thing, you don't make it recurring, you'll just end up giving it away. And so I actually yeah. wrote like writing out what does my ideal life look like, which is a stoic thing, and what are the top five priorities. Like if I scored myself a 10 out of 10 on these top five things, which for me, and I don't mind sharing because it's similar, should be for most people, it was health and well-being at number one, um, Courtney and Corby, my wife and son. And those ones were flipped for a long time until I think someone actually said to me, like, do you realise if you don't take care of your health, you're going to be useless to your wife and son? And I was like, oh, like that was a massive shift. So I had to rewrite them. So it was number one, health and well-being. Cause, and I literally say it to myself, without that, I can't take care of Courtney and Corby. And then number three was financial freedom. It's always been a big thing for me. Um, number four, self-sufficiency. And number five for me, it had been for the last five years, literally becoming a lawyer. Um, and so yeah. every morning I actually wrote out a 365-day. I got Courtney to make it for me, and it had those things on it. And then I would write every morning, what is one habit I can do today to get like my health and well-being in order. What's one habit I can do to make sure Courtney and Corby, we have a good relationship, play with my son, I have a good healthy relationship with my wife. And I did that for every category. And so I've it's kind of awesome now because the, the beauty of journaling for me is you can go back and I score myself before I go to bed on these categories out of 10, what was today? So I've got this algorithm now which I can go, like, when did I have a 10 out of 10? Never had 10 out of 10 in all categories, but when did I have yeah. a really high score? And what did I do that day? And turns out I got up, I jumped in the pool, um, I did a body workout, then spent a bit of time with Courtney before Corby got up, then yeah. played with Corby before school. Then I got to work and I killed it at work and I followed, like, what I need to do at work. And then I got home and I did a bit of archery and did a bit of jiu-jitsu for the self-sufficiency. And then at night I made sure I got my study done. I watched the lecture. And I can like, when I'm having the down days and like the sick days and when you just don't feel it, you can scroll back through your journal and see, hey, dumb dumb, like you've got a roadmap here <laughs> and this is what you should be doing. And so the, yeah. the power of that is extraordinary. Um and that, for me, now I've got books and books and books that because I've been doing it every day for about eight years, that if there's nothing else, and hopefully there's a lot else, I'll, I'll leave my son. But if there's nothing else, he'll have those books, which are um, gold, because it's, for me, it's yeah. the algorithm for my ideal life is literally laid out there. So I uh, yeah, I love them. Mate. That's, as you say, it's gold. You can always you've always got something to come back to. You know, mm. it, as in if they, if they didn't necessarily go to plan, right? Let's go back to that. Let's uh, let's figure out. Yeah, you know, compare it to a day that did go well. What what went right? Yeah. Um, but mate, it kind of leads me on really nicely actually to my 
sort of final question, which is around the idea of success to you. And I, I think you kind of already answered it there with those five, let's say, pillars of mm. you know, things that you really care about and that, that mean a lot to you. I, I'm going to twist up a little bit my question. How in success to you is is those things, right? But how important is success sort of, because I think about success for me is like, uh, I've got the things I care about in my life, like similar things to you, but I've learned it's not necessarily smashing it on all of those levels. It's success to me is doing my best at those things and learning to be okay if one of those things drops off. Mm. Is that what does success mean to you? I guess is it, is it is it trying to just smash all of those five pillars and make sure everything's in line, or is it more learning to be okay when? Um, you know, things necessarily don't go to plan. Yeah, it's it's the other side of it. It is accepting, which is the stoic um, philosophy to, I think it's the stoic prayer. It's to accept the things you cannot control and to focus on the things you can. Um, that's, that's essentially serenity. Like, no, and that for me, it makes things when things don't go well, particularly at work, when you miss out on the sale or you just it doesn't go well, the client, uh, how we're handling a matter for them. Um, it's an inner peace to know I've got for me those two people waiting for me at home, um, and I've got my health, the other things aren't. They're, they're not number one and two for a reason. And so success is being able to remind myself um, that no matter what, yeah, if, if it all falls apart, I've still got those two things, which means I've really found found my ideal life. Um, and I think that's what yeah. stoicism was so important in doing was it's not about the happiness, it's not about um, the achievement or knocking down the goal or anything. Like those things happen through habit. But if you can wake up every day and know and be focused on at least working towards that ideal life, that to me is is success. So weirdly, because I'm always striving for what's the next thing, and it's only as I'm saying it to you, I'm thinking I've kind of, yeah, I know I'm on the pathway anyway, um, and it's probably not going to be, there's no destination. It's just you well, keep that's it. The, the, the pathway is the... This is something I've learned. The pathway is the real, like the the the, the journey is the real goal, mm. because when you get to the end result, there's always another goal that you're you're fo focused on. Yeah. So the like for me, like a hap like the happiness comes from the pursuit rather than the the end goal. Is something I've really re only realized in the last I don't know year or so. Like, yeah, you're never finished, and there's never there's never like an end. Where like right when I hit that point, whatever, everything will be perfect. Like it doesn't exist. So yeah. learn to strive and enjoy the, the 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 pursuit rather than the end goal. I think the way you're saying it too, the um the founding fathers in America, they I don't know who said it. It was not recently I heard it. But they said you have the founding fathers wrote you have the the right to the pursuit of happiness. You don't have the right to happiness. It was the right to the pursuit of it. And it was such a, I was yeah. like, that's exactly right. Because to be honest, the right to happiness doesn't really exist, but the pursuit of it. So when they wrote that document of every person has those inalienable rights and one of them is the pursuit of happiness, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah they knew something back then as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so good. And I've even started to like, set myself like the goals i set myself now are so like far away in the future and it you know theme, things like because everything the enjoyment you get is is more the in the build up to something than the actual thing yeah. so like you know i've started booking holidays like a year in advance just so i can enjoy the 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 sort of build up to yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and when, when i realized that i was just like that is like crazy um yeah yeah so, mate um Thank you so much for for coming on and sharing all that. I was really enjoyed that that conversation. You shared a heap of wisdom there that I think I know. For one, I'll be um, I'll be listening back and, uh, and learning from, uh, and anyone else who listened to, I think will gain uh, a lot. So I really appreciate you doing that, mate. And uh, it's great to see 
um, like, like we spoke about, things sort of coming together you, for you and your personal life and this new venture going really well. So long may it continue. Lofty, thank you very much. Thanks, man. Uh, let's play and stay in touch. Cheers.